I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 8. Uh, we're continuing our Just Jesus series, looking at the Gospel of Luke and specifically looking at changed lives right now. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's okay. Grab one of the Bibles in the pews. They look amazingly like this one. And turn to page 1100 and you will find our text for the day in Luke chapter 8. Uh, hey, uh, something I want you to think about, pray about, uh, know about. You know, we're, we want people to serve, and we've got a serve ministry here at Calvary. Uh, I want you to go on our website and sign up to be part of that. As we're helping people in the church uh, serve within the church, uh, also to serve our community. And one of the big things that we're doing is uh, each year we do mission trips. Now, we do one-day trips up to the Wallapai Nation uh, working in Peach Springs. We do weekend trips down to the border working in Mexico. Uh, but we've got uh, several large trips that I want to encourage you to think about, pray about, especially if this is something that God's been kind of prompting you to do. In June, we're going to Albania. In July, we're going to Idaho. And in uh, October, we're going to Thailand, do a medical trip. And if you've ever thought you might want to uh, participate in one of those, then check out the information in your bulletin. Email or contact one of the people who's leading those trips and say, hey, give me some more information. I want to pray about this and know about this. Now, if you've got a teenager at home or as a child or a grandchild, it is worth you investing in them to send them or even better, take them with you on a trip like this because it can be a life-changing opportunity for them and for you as well as the people that we're going to minister to. If you've got little kids at home and you're thinking, oh, good, I don't have to pay for that now because mine aren't teenagers, start saving up now. It may be 10 years out, but start putting money aside and saying, hey, when you're old enough, we're going to go on one of these trips because I want you to experience God's life-changing power firsthand. So that said, you guys know this is Super Bowl weekend, right? Yeah. we got. There's, I've, I've noticed there's some people wearing some jerseys, and a lot of people ask me, how come I'm not wearing a Cardinals jersey? Because I'm still in denial. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm confessing that, but, uh, you know, in just a, a few hours, two teams, the Panthers and the Broncos, are going to be battling for supremacy of the National Football League. And I would love to know who you want to win. So on the count of three, tell me who you want to win. One, two, three. Broncos! Yeah. You know, uh, the Broncos have outnumbered the Panthers in uh, almost every service, especially when it comes to jerseys. So, uh, uh, but here's the thing. We don't know who's going to win. You know, the, the see, somebody just said Seahawks, <laughs> and I thought I was in denial. Um, wow. So I even, at least I know the, you know, Cardinals aren't playing in the Super Bowl. So, um, so here's, <laughs> I know, the Seahawks fans are like, if the Seahawks aren't there, it's not the Super Bowl. So, uh, but here's the thing, you know, we don't know who's going to win. They've got to play the game, and one team is favored, and the other team isn't, and, uh, you know, everybody has their opinions, and, and they're rooting for their teams. But here's the thing. If you knew for certain who was going to win the game, I mean, there was no doubt, not like you thought they were going to win, but if you knew for certain, you'd take all your possessions, cash them out, go up to Vegas, you know, bet on the game, come back, pay for the church, uh, and, uh, <laughs> right, that's what we do, right? And, uh you do that, but it, there's uncertainty about the game. Either team is capable of winning. So speaking of battles, how many of you have seen the, the new Star Wars? Okay, a lot of hands go up. How many of you have ever seen any Star Wars movies? Okay, yeah, more hands go up. See, in Star Wars, uh, by the way, the, the new one's the largest grossing uh, movie of all time. Uh, but it depicts a conflict between good and evil, light and darkness. And the winner is always unclear. It kind of goes back and forth. And, and there's always that question of who's going to come out on top. And a lot of people mistakenly believe that the battle between good and evil in our world is like those. That it's up in the air. It's to be determined. That it's a real contest. Today, I want you to definitively know that there really is no battle. No question who's going to win because God's power is greater than Satan's power. God's power is greater than Satan's power. Our story today in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 26, is an amazing story of life change. But I want you to read this with me, and I want you to kind of look at it from the vantage point of power. Who has the power? How is that manifest? How is that displayed in this account? Beginning in verse 26, Luke chapter 8, it says, Then they, being Jesus and the disciples, 
sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. So they went across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. And when Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time, it, the demon, had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And the demons begged him to let them enter these. So Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding area of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. What an amazing story that demonstrates that God's power is greater than Satan's power. I don't know if you've noticed this, but before anything really took place in the story, the demons were literally begging for mercy from Jesus. In other words, they had no power. These demons that had had ruined this man's life, that had made him uh, like a superhuman freak, where he terrorized people and they'd chain him up and try to imprison him and he'd break the chains free and, and he'd go and terrorize the countryside. This guy that had all this power was begging Jesus for mercy. These demons that had all this power were begging Jesus for mercy. That just demonstrates that God is the one who has the authority. Those demons had no power in the presence of Jesus. And by the way, that's because God has all authority and all power. He is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He is the one who created and he is the one who will conclude. God is Savior and Judge. You see, God's power is real and it is absolute. Satan's power is real, but it's limited. Now, before we dive into this, uh, I know some of you are are wondering, all right, come on, really, seriously, demons? Are you going to try to convince me that the demons are real? I mean, you believe that evil's out there, but is it personified? You know, is Satan a real person or thing that, you know, you worry about, does he have demons that serve him and, and everything? And, and uh, you know, I, I'll just confess, I was kind of raised in that um, kind of rational faith school of thought that said, hey, maybe this guy just had a mental illness and he was crazy and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And that's what, when it talks about demons, about that's kind of what, you know, maybe it, it could be understood as. Except this story is one of those that convinced me otherwise. Because if demons aren't real, how do you explain the pigs? Right? I mean, something motivated the pigs to go crazy and rush down this bank and drown themselves. I don't think pigs are naturally suicidal. <laughs> and, and so, you know, something had to happen that, that moved them. And, you know, you think about it this way. The, the guy with the demon said, you know, his name was Legion. A legion of soldiers was 6,000 troops in Roman times. 6,000 troops. So if there's 6,000 demons in this guy and 2,000 pigs, that's three demons per pig. That's what made him go crazy. Now, I'm just telling you that because uh, evil is real and Satan is its champion. But know this and be encouraged. If you belong to Jesus, Satan cannot control your life. 
He can't possess you. He can't make you do things. He can't be an excuse for your choices. He doesn't have the ability to do that. I don't care what kind of things Hollywood produces in terms of movies that scare you. First uh, John 4.4, 4, uh, the apostle writes, For he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Did you get that? He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then Satan cannot control your life, period. Why? Because the moment you confess Jesus as Lord, God the Holy Spirit moved into your life. He claimed it in the name of Jesus. He wrote Jesus' name on your soul. You belong to him. He moves in and resides in you. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you, and he is greater than Satan, so Satan can't control you because the Holy Spirit is in you. Satan would have to be able to beat the Holy Spirit to take your life over. He can't do that. We know he can't do that because you see what the demons did in the presence of Jesus? Yeah. And, and so Satan can't control your life because the Holy Spirit is greater than the enemy. James chapter 4, verse 7. Great verse. You ought, to, you ought to memorize this one. It simply says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Isn't that cool? If you surrender control to God and you resist Satan, he's going to run away. He's going to flee from you. And, and that is an amazing promise. Think about this. I, I don't know if you, what kind of church you grew up in or if you even grew up in church, but I grew up in churches where, where people are always worried about Satan attacking. And, and so, you know, they would pray prayers, you know, for people to say, I'm going to pray that, you know, God protects you from Satan's attack. And sometimes they'd use phrases like, I'm going to pray a hedge of protection around you. And, and that doesn't really connect with James chapter 4. You know what I'm saying? Because the, the hedge of protection thing is kind of like, well, Satan's a shark and I'm inside the shark cage so he can't get at me. Right? That's not what James is saying though, is it? James is saying, you don't need a stinking shark cage because you're the aggressor and Satan's the one who's going to run from you when you submit to God and you have his power in your life. That you don't need to be protected because Satan's going to run away. That's amazing. So if you belong to Jesus, Satan can't control you because God's power is greater than Satan's always. Now that said, Satan can impact your life. He can influence your life. He can affect your life. So how does he do that? Primarily two ways. First of all, lies. Satan lies to us. In fact, Jesus called Satan the father of lies. John chapter 8, verse 44 Long verse. He's talking to the Pharisees who, who pretty much are disparaging Jesus. And he says, you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And there is no truth in him. He has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, out of his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. All lies originate with Satan. And here's the thing, Satan is a master salesman, and he wants to sell you his junk. He wants to sell you on his lies. And here's the thing, we should think, well, I don't, want to know, I don't want to believe his lies, but the thing is, we want to believe some of his lies. You and I actually want to believe some of the things that Satan is telling us. Like for me, I want to believe that I can eat all the ice cream I want and lose weight. And yet I discovered that that is a lie and it's not going to happen. I can do one or the other, but I can't do both. Think about it. There's a lot of lies you want to believe too. Like the lie that having more money will make you happier. Yeah, there's a lot of us, if we're gut level honest, we still hold on to that deep down inside. And we think, well, if I just won the lottery, I'd be happy. Yeah, if I just had this money, I'd be happy. No, the truth is, you'd just be more comfortable in your misery. <laughs> Might be able to go more places with your misery, but... Uh, you see, Satan's lies will imprison us. That's why Jesus said, if you remain in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. 
That's why we encourage you to read the Bible. That's why if you don't have a Bible, we invite you to take one of these because we want you to read God's Word because we know if you read God's Word, it will change your life. It will set you free. That's why we encourage you to be involved in life groups and Bible studies because as you learn more about God's Word and with others as you study it, the lies of Satan that you're imprisoned by will become evident. And so you need other people around you because, you know, we'll do the whole denial thing. You know, we'll still think the Seahawks are in the Super Bowl. <laughs> so we, we will we'll lie to ourselves. We need friends around us who will say, eh, now nah, you're, you're kind of drinking the wrong Kool-Aid here. You need to go ahead and accept the truth of God's Word because it applies to your life and it will set you free. Because when we learn the truth, we can identify the lies that are imprisoning us and we can journey to freedom. So Satan impacts our life through lies and through temptation. Temptation. In in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, it tells the story of Jesus being tempted by Satan. And here's the thing. Jesus was tempted by Satan. Hebrews says he was tempted in every way that we are, yet was without sin. In sin. So Jesus was tempted. Guess what, guys? We know we're tempted too. Every one of us faces temptation, sometimes by our own desires, sometimes the enemy is the one who tempts us. And here's the reality. Satan wants to wreck your life. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your faith. He wants to destroy your influence for Jesus. That's his goal. And so he watches us and learns our weaknesses. Satan doesn't know everything, but he watches us. And after a while, if he watches us, he learns our weaknesses. He learns our tastes for sin. Do you guys realize that all of us have a taste for sin? Some kind of sin. I mean, now, here's what we do in the church. A lot of times is we kind of excuse our taste in sin, and we condemn everybody else's taste in sin. So we, we tend to do that, but the truth is all of us have a taste for sin, and Satan knows what our tastes are. So, you know, if you come and, and you offer me, you know, coffee-flavored ice cream, I'm not tempted Not in the least. That's disgusting. I'm not going to eat it. If you bring an oatmeal raisin cookie to me, no. All right? From where I sit, raisins are of the devil. Okay? (laughs) You may have a different conviction. That's just mine. I'm not eating it. There's no point in you bringing me Brussels sprouts. It's not a temptation to me. I don't care if you dip them in chocolate. I'm still not going to eat them. You know, there's some things that we're tempted by and some things we're not. And, and, and Satan is going to come to you in your point of weakness, in your point of flavor. And he's going to offer up what you want, and you're going to have to decide what you're going to do. Don't be ignorant of that. Understand and know that God's power is greater. We can overcome any temptation. We can learn the truth. We can reject the lies. But it is a daily choice an hour-by-hour, moment-by-moment choice to follow Jesus and say no to the one who's going to wreck our lives if we give in. So I want to ask you a question that will require some really honest evaluation. You and God need to have this conversation. Maybe you'll talk about it in your life group. But which power is influencing your life? God's or Satan's? In the the book of Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes about the tension for followers of Christ uh, and and that battle between desiring to do what God wants and desiring uh, or doing what our body desires, the evil desires that are within us. And, And in fact, in the middle of that chapter, verse 16, he says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature or the flesh. Um. So which way is your life leaning? Now, you might protest and say, well, Pastor Chad, we're in church and we're Christians. We've already chose Jesus. But Paul was writing to a church of people just like us. And he said, there's a battle going on. Uh, We're all influenced by evil to some degree. So listen to the descriptions that Paul has in Galatians 5. In fact, I'd encourage you, when you go home today, uh, sometime read Galatians 5. Let God speak directly to you about your life. Here's what Paul describes as the evidence of the flesh and the evidence of the Spirit in our lives. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, 
impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So which way is your life leaning? What's evident in your life? In your relationships, are you building up your marriage? Are you building up your kids? Or are you being destructive? On that inner world that you live in, on the inside that no one else sees, are you you consumed by fear and anxiety and worries? Or do you have peace and contentment? Are you living your life for yourself? Are you focused on blessing others? How about this one? When you don't get your way, what pops out? Rage or kindness? You see, right now, is your life being more influenced by the Holy Spirit or by this evil world that we live in? You know, when you wrestle with that, if the answer isn't what you want, then I want you to know that Jesus can bring sanity to your life. Let's go back to the story. Notice verse 35. I think this is my favorite verse in this whole passage. It says, Then the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. This guy went from being an out-of-control, wild man terrorizing the neighbors, just, you know, being destructive to himself and to others. In fact, a lot of you could probably relate to that, huh? That's who you used to be. And Jesus changed his life. Jesus radically and completely changed his life from a wild man to being clothed and in his right mind. Sanity. You see, Jesus changes us. Sometimes like this man, he does it radically and quickly. Some of you have that story. That's your testimony. You met Jesus and everything changed that day. Others of us, in fact, usually we we change through a process where we choose to follow Jesus and we get to know him better and we learn more and we choose to obey more and, and it just keeps going. As we get to know Jesus better, our life changes more and more. Either way, Jesus changes us and brings us to sanity. And we need that. Because so often, we are living lives in insanity, right? I mean, think about this. My favorite definition of insanity is this, and you guys probably know it. Doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. Yeah, I mean, don't we do that in our marriage? I mean, you know, you get in the same fight with your spouse over and over and over again. I mean, it's like you guys rehearsed it. Right? Same subject, same lines. You can almost say what your spouse is going to say before they do. That's a pattern of insanity. It doesn't get you anywhere. With the kids, you have the same discussion, same argument. You get so frustrated at your kids. Why can't they get it? You have the same fears and worries and anxieties that are keeping you up all night. You have the same destructive habits that you're doing over and over and over again, and you repent every single time. You say, God, I don't want to do this anymore. And yet you do it again. You see, Jesus changes our lives and he will bring us to a healthy place. But you got to ask him to do that. you got to say, Jesus, I, I really want you this change in my life. I'm going to take these steps to change. But know this, if you ask Jesus to change your life, it will cost you some pigs. It'll cost you some pigs. Did you notice in the story what happened? You know, a bunch of pigs died. And the people didn't like it. You, 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 amazing, you, you guys come out from the city and the countryside and they look at what happened and they, and they see Jesus and they see the guy sitting there closing his right mind and they go, the pigs died? All right, you guys leave. They valued the pigs more than they valued Jesus. They valued the pigs more than they valued this man's changed life. And sometimes we're the same way. If you really want Jesus to change you, there's going to be loss. In your life, he might kill some of your pigs. He he might destroy some habits that are stinking up your life. 
I'm pretty sure he's going to alter the relationship patterns that have been insane. Because remember, love is patient and love is kind. He's probably going to mess with your priorities and rearrange what's really important in your life. And it's probably going to cost you financially because Jesus promotes generosity and sacrifice without apology. I guess what I'm saying is this. If you love your life just the way it is, you might not want Jesus messing it up. But if your life is filled with craziness, if it's out of control, if there's insanity, even in just portions of it, Jesus can bring sanity to your life. But if he does, if you ask him to do this and he starts changing you, know that it will make some people uncomfortable. Hmm. Um, Jesus freaked out the townspeople. Didn't he? I mean, you wouldn't think that'd freak him out in a bad way. You'd think, hey, wow, you rescued us from the demon guy who was terrorizing the graveyard. But they didn't. They said, uh, we're afraid. Twice it uses that phrase. They were filled with fear. They were afraid of what they saw. And they asked Jesus to go away. So if God changes your life, some people won't want to hang out with you anymore. Some people will feel guilty when they're around you. Uh, it always makes me kind of chuckle and I feel bad a little bit when I'll be hanging around people who you know, don't really know me all that well. And, and they start apologizing for their language. It doesn't bother me, but it ruins their day. I'm like, okay. Some people will accuse you of joining a cult or becoming a fanatic. But, and, and here's the reality. Most people are comfortable with our insanity. You know why? Because it's predictable. You've been that way for a long time. And so they're, they're comfortable because, let's be honest, some people just like having someone crazier than themselves around. So when Jesus changes your life, one of two things is going to happen. Either it's going to give them hope that God can change their life too, or it's going to scare them away. Just know that. So when Jesus changes your life, it's going to cost you some pigs, it's going to make people uncomfortable, and Jesus will give you a mission. When he changes our life, when he brings sanity into our lives, he's going to give you a mission. This story ends differently than any other encounter with Jesus in the Gospels. Look at the last two verses again. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with Jesus. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the only person in the Gospels who actually says, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, no. Now, he was a follower of Jesus. He understood the life-changing power of Jesus. So Jesus wasn't saying, no, you can't be my follower. But he did say, you can't go with me. Now, why couldn't he go with him? Well, because he was a Gentile. That whole area of the the Gerasenes was Gentile area. And Jesus was going back to uh, Galilee. And he's going to go down to Judea, Jerusalem. And he's going to be in the temple. And having a Gentile tagging along would just be a distraction. It really wasn't going to work. And Jesus knew that, and so he said to the man, look, you can't go with me, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to the people who know how messed up your life was. Go back to those people who saw you demon-possessed, who saw you running naked through the tombs, who saw you when you were a wild man out of control, and tell them what God has done for you. That's our mission, too. That's our mission. If Jesus has changed your life, that is your mission. You see, you don't have to be trained to do this. You don't need a seminary degree. You don't need a title. Just tell the people who know how messed up and destructive your life was what the Savior has done for you. That's our mission. So has Jesus changed your life? I want you to know that no matter where you've been or what you've done, he has the power to change you. No matter where you are right now, he has the power to change your life. Will you ask Jesus to change your life today? I pray that you do. And I pray that you're willing to give up some of the pigs. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Even when we are unlovely, even when we are rebellious and angry and out of control, you still love us and you sent Jesus into this world to die for us so that we could live eternally. 
And Father, I pray right now that every person in this room would sense the presence of your Holy Spirit, would know that he has the power to change our lives, to lead us to health, to restore sanity, to help us to be the sons and daughters of God that you've called us to be. So God, let us hear your voice. Let us sense your presence, your love, your power, your grace, and your mercy. And Lord, we ask that you would change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship our God.